Welcome to the Startup Grind. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Jared Polis. How'd you like that? That was a great chair. I'm so happy. They haven't, they haven't been legislating in Congress all day. <laughs> Actually, you look like you were in Congress all day. Yes, yes, yeah. Yep. I, I, we were, I'm so glad that you, you came here because... Uh, did, um, we, did we scare you when we said I might not make it? Yes, you nice? did. Yeah. Uh, it's really scary because... Uh, but no, uh, you were supposed to... You guys are supposed to do the debt ceiling vote. And we yep. did it. We and did we it. We did it today. It right. passed. The debt ceiling is raised. Our nation's full faith and credit will continue. For now. <laughs> Those guys have jobs now, so. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to, we always like to start off on a personal note. I think we're a little bit too close here. Are we a little too close here for comfort, comfort here? Are we good? <laughs> we're fine. We like to start off on a personal note, like, uh, you know, where were you born? Where were you raised? What did your parents do? And perhaps talk about, you know, entrepreneurial childhood experience, you know, right. recent. Memory. Well, I was born in Boulder, Colorado, as you mentioned in the introduction. Uh, my family, growing up, moved to San Diego, uh, where I went through most of my school years. We would uh, also spend time in Boulder. And I grew up in a small family business. My mother is a poet, and my father is an artist. Uh, and in the 70s, they started um, uh, a, a publishing company, so they did greeting cards and calendars and books. Uh, featuring their their artwork and their poetry, uh, so I grew up going from you know one trade show to the next and uh, working in the booths. My grandmother was the sales manager, uh, and it was a great experience. Really, kind of uh, seeing firsthand you know in a small family business and learning sales in particular, which I helped my grandmother with. So that was sort of your first childhood entrepreneurial experience. Mm -hmm. Is working with you grandma? know, I was always trying to do entrepreneurial stuff myself. I grew tomatoes and sold them in a tomato stand in the neighborhood. Uh, in Fourth of July in Boulder, uh, people would hike up to uh, watch fireworks from, uh, we were kind of at the edge of town on the hill, and so we would bake cookies and stuff and sell it to the hikers, uh, when, you know, so I did always doing things like that. That's nice. So, uh, I mean, you said you're from Boulder. Uh, are you a big Broncos fan? Well, I'm more of a baseball fan, okay. but I, I'm a Broncos fan. Okay. It was uh, we just my condolences, um, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but we made it pretty far this year, sure. so yeah. it's a good team. Now I was going to say because uh, uh, this is the first Super Bowl where two teams came from the only state that legalized weed, and so instead of calling it, I mean, I was thinking instead of calling it the Super Bowl, we could probably call it the Super Bong. I don't know. You know, you know, <laughs> um, the first 11 seconds were pretty close. Sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so let's get right to the Blue Mountain art story. Um, one question I really wanted to ask is, how did you get involved, you know, with your parents, and what's that like running a startup with your, you know, with your parents? I mean, is it sort of difficult, and what are sort of the challenges you had, and what are some of the strengths of going in business with your relatives? Well, it was great. Um, you know, we uh, all worked together, um, you know, and complemented one another. Certainly, my father's competency is around creating the, the art uh, and the animation and the cards. Uh, uh, we used some Blue Mountain materials uh, from the physical company, but very quickly we grew to license a broad variety of content. The, uh, the legacy company, Blue Mountain Arts, really has a certain kind of love and friendship niche. The online site was a little bit of everything. Um, so it was a, a very exciting endeavor. We um, uh, my first company was an internet access provider that I started with two friends in college. And really, um, Blue Mountain Arts and BlueMountain.com kind of got started of, okay, well, we have an ISP, we're growing it, let's try to get the family company online. And that was the first BlueMountain.com website. Sure, and that, that's, that's the online greeting card, right, the Blue Mountain, mm -hmm. which you had, um, in three years, sold it to Ex Excite at Home for quite a, quite a large sum. Of money. Yeah, it uh, became, uh, uh, we started in 96, it became uh, one of the top 10 sites on the internet. I think in, the, uh, in, the, in its highest month, it was the sixth most popular website on the entire internet uh, around the time we sold it. Right, I mean, this is sort of like, uh, this is where it all began, really. I mean, this is where the door, this is the door that opened many doors to come. And I would say 
uh, this was your first major exit. How did you feel when you had that first exit? Well, the first exit was American Information Systems. So we sold that in uh, 98. So um, that provided some of the seed capital that went into proflowers.com, which uh, founded around the same time, actually, because I really actually founded with the seed capital from the AIS sale. That was an internet access provider in Chicago. Uh, And that was, a, I think, if I recall, I think a $32 million exit. Um, you know, all these numbers seem huge, uh, and they are huge, so um, that was a big deal. That was, you know, me and my business partners in AIS went out to a big uh, dinner, expensive dinner, and steak dinner and all that, so it was a pretty big deal. So, <laughs> um, so now, like, so you, you touch upon on the pro flowers. How did that idea come about? I mean, um, there's many times, and... Trust me, Pro Flowers have saved my butt many times over. There's still time to order, as right, you said, exactly. Valentine's Flowers. Valentine's I Day. I ordered mine. Right. But, I no know, longer own it, but I'm still a loyal customer. But I'm saying that that idea was, you know, pops up in every, every mm-hmm. man's head where, you know, every, every Mother's Day I would send the flowers and, and it saved my butt where my mom wouldn't talk to me mm-hmm. if I didn't order flowers from Pro Flowers. She wouldn't talk to me until the next Mother's Day, so... How did that? How did how did the pro flowers that idea come about? Well, this was really a uh, supply chain uh, innovation. Um, the flowers were uh, too expensive and too old. They would go from growers to wholesalers to distributors to retailers, and people would get them and they die a few days later. And uh, we, really, the innovation that I came up with was to disintermediate the floral supply chain, send flowers directly from the grower to the end consumer. We were able to initiate. Uh, policies like a seven-day freshness guarantee. They were guaranteed to stay fresh in the vase seven days. Uh, we were able to, uh, because of the overhead that accrued in the legacy model along the way, we were able to be extremely competitive on price. Uh, and uh, so it was a great innovation in the marketplace. And uh, we used technology from the distribution side. Obviously, sales and marketing and customer acquisition were through online channels as well. But I always looked at it primarily as a distribution technology company. Okay. Now, this is the part where this is incomes tech stars. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's talk about that. Like, how did you get, how did you meet, you know, David Cohen, Brad Feld, David Brown? I mean, these are some of the biggest names in the startup community. I mean, of course, you as well. But well, I mean, we, weren't as, get... we weren't all as big back then. Okay, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've known Brad since he moved to Colorado in 1996. Okay. So we were very good. So there wasn't a lot of us in the I guess late 90s, you know, doing internet startups, right? So uh, I knew Brad very right after he moved to Colorado. Um, David uh, Cohen, I got to know soon after. Uh, David Brown, I didn't know until we worked together in Techstars. I mean, maybe I'd met him socially, but it wasn't uh, a very large community out there, and we certainly all knew each other. So how, how did this Techstar idea come about? I mean, who reached yeah. out to who, and whose original idea was it? It was David it? Cohen, was the main driver. So he um, came up, and the concept has evolved, uh, but certainly uh, he pitched the initial concept to Brad Feld and to I, uh, who were able to, you know, put together the backing to do that first year and make it work. Uh, but it was really David's vision, uh, and uh, as well as his work on the implementation side, that uh, really led to the magic that's uh, spread across the country and the uh, new number of successful companies that have emerged from it. Right, right. And this this started like 2006. Yeah, I was the, just thinking we um, I might have we we just we had a big. Uh, it seemed like it was our. Big anniversary. Maybe it was maybe it was only the seventh or eighth. I thought it was the tenth. Maybe I don't know. But it was a big anniversary. We were all back there just last year, and so I don't know if that was maybe it was the tenth from inception or the you know eighth class. But yeah, it's been going a while now. Uh, I obviously was more active in the early stages. Um, you know, we were we had a lot less applicants in the early stages, um, uh, but we would go through all the companies. You know, pick the companies, and I was active, especially in the first few classes, and ment- you know, actively mentoring some of the companies that came through. Okay, and that's actually a very good segue to this whole thing about you know accelerators. Uh, one of the things, one of the secret sauces for any world class accelerators, is its deep uh, pool of mentors. So, to talk about that, how did you recruit? And I believe it was seventy mentors. How many how many advisors do you guys have now in, in Texas? Oh gosh, you know, lost count. But you know, really, again, between yeah. uh, David Cohen, David Brown, Brad, and I, I mean, we knew most of the people in the, t- the community who had been involved with startups, been involved with tech, and uh, most of them, almost to a person, really enjoy this. And so they right. wanted to do it. I mean, it wasn't like we had to beg or cajole. People were like, sure, I'll be a mentor. And it may mean none of the companies in a particular year are of great interest, and so you're not doing much, or maybe you absolutely love two of them, and they do their own angel investments and go on two boards. I mean, it's entirely up to 
uh, each mentor what they make of it. But um, really, between us, we were able to be one degree of separation with you know everybody in the startup community in Colorado. It's a it's a town of old, Boulder's only a town of about one hundred ten thousand people. So, I mean, right now, tech stars have like some of the amazing mentors known on this planet, uh, David Carr, David Crowley. I mean, there's, the list just goes on. And it's amazing how it started, you know, with just 70, I mean, I imagine they're not even, they weren't even that big in the startup uh, world. But now you guys have such a big following and momentum. How many, do you know how many uh, mentors you guys have? Oh, it's probably gosh, like I don't know. Thousand? You know, quality yeah. is, is just as important as quantity, because anybody sure. can just put together a list of names and say, here's an infinite number of mentors. But I mean, the quality is what I think we pride ourselves on. Okay, and, and that's, that's actually a good segue to the next question, which I've heard uh, from others that there's a lot of accelerators. They would have some sort of, I don't know, maybe you can verify this, but a buy-in. So if I wanted to be a mentor, you know, I would put in forty thousand dollars to, you know, be part of the mentor network. Is is that is that did the tech stars do something like that? Nothing formal like that as part of the program by any means. Um, as I said, they're you know. Certainly, mentors that wanted to could uh, do angel investments in companies. Some some didn't. If it turns out their company wasn't going to raise capital, um, they weren't able to do a round. But no, there certainly was no uh, uh, promise that they had to do anything in particular besides be available to mentor the companies. Got it. I mean, because when someone had told me that, that I was thinking, well, that sort of makes logical sense, right? I mean, you have skin in the game, and then you'll have sort of you're buying access to deal flow, right? Um, to great. Startup, so that, that's why I was wanted to ask you about. I that. think a lot of the mentors are looking to have fun and deploy their skills and, and maybe get involved. And, you know, some of them did move on and even become CEOs of some of these companies post financing. Uh, others uh, became board members and you know might have got options that way. And some became investors. But I mean, there's no there's no one path. I mean, it's they're, they're certainly not just there to be investors uh, either. Okay. okay. And um, how, how often, so I'm sure there's a lot of people here that are sort of curious if they get into an accelerator, you know, how often, sh you know, do you get, did you guys have a regiment of, hey, you need to meet your mentorees once a week, uh, or, you know, did, did, you, did you have, and once a quarter, did you have sort, sort, sort of like a schedule meet, it, or did you just leave it up to the mentors and mentors? So every, first of all, every, um, every accelerator is different. So this was a, um, you know, two and a half month program. Uh, in summer, housed together uh, in one place, uh, and they had uh, regular mentor visits with the companies, and it was a full-time program for everybody who was there. Um, that doesn't necessarily port over to different things that call themselves accelerators these days. Um, we um, made sure that, that we had the trying to find the right mentors for each startup is something that was very important, making sure we had the right skill sets. What do you need? Is it marketing expertise that you need. And then that's, that's between you expertise. guys decide like who's who you pair up. Uh, exactly. Trying okay. to trying to match you, you know, uh, both both on the personal chemistry as well as on the core competencies and the expertise uh, was a big part of it too. But again, it's not formal to the extent of, you know, you have to do this, you know, X time, this right. much per day right. with each mentor. Okay. Um, how many of you guys are thinking about applying to tech stars or any of the other top accelerators like 500 Startups, YC, anybody else? Anybody in this room? Okay, there's only three people who are gonna approach you afterwards, so. Great. Okay, great, well, that's a good sign. There you, go. you know, I mean, these programs have been very successful. Obviously, the quality of the program matters. I mean, some are better than others. But in general, uh, they are uh, kind of a rapid way to position yourself uh, for financing and for growth and to really work through your idea in an accelerated fashion in a period of a few months. So, um, you know, obviously you can recreate a lot of that benefit in a community here like 1776, but there are different kinds of experiences. And so, uh, you know, one, you can immerse yourself however much you want uh, in the startup world. And actually, that's a good point to another question where, how mature does your startup have to be when applying to these accelerators? Mm -hmm. I mean, do I need to have a prototype built? Do I need to have a customer strategy, a customer acquisition strategy? Maybe have a thousand, you know, a million users? Uh, do I need to have a board of advisors in place? And do I well, need if, to have coverage, like media if coverage? You, if you have applying? a million users, you're ready for Series A. I mean, <laughs> there's no question. You, you should not be, uh, you don't need to look at an accelerator. Um, we have let in 
all of the above. I mean, each accelerator is going to be different again. I would say that it's migrated slightly away towards you know mid mid stage to, from early stage in the first few years, but there are still um, you know pre proof of concept companies that will get in. But many of much of the competition kind of has some type of beta or proof of concept, and so you're up against that. It doesn't mean with the right team uh, and the right idea. It can't get in before that, but um, there are still other accelerators that are specialized in concept stage all the way through to uh, you know to rollout stage. So it really just depends. I think it's the most value you know in that early stage, right around the time you're working on kind of your initial rollout. Great, great. Um, and I was about that, a lot of the companies that have come through TechStars have uh, pivoted on their ideas as well. Um, I would say. What would you, yeah, what's the per percentage? I haven't run the analytics, so I'd have to do it, but I would guess um, upwards of, I mean, we're talking major pivots, probably about a third. Wow. Uh, and, and some kind of shifting, probably two thirds. Wow. So a third are really doing something very different. Um, might be, you know, tangential, but very different. And only, and then two thirds are doing something that's shifting. Only, so I'm saying only one third are probably uh, recognizable idea. in right. terms of what they're actually doing, what they thought exactly what they were doing. So this is actually that's, that's, that's just my guess. It, sure, you know. sure. Um, no, and that that sort of uh, is it's talked. We're going to talk about the metrics. Mm -hmm. um, so I heard that uh, tech stars to get into tech stars is harder to get into tech stars than say Harvard, right? And uh, that's what I heard. That's Probably true, right? Yeah, I, there's different cities, obviously, yeah. and they all have different things. But I, and you know, it it, it could very well be um, it's getting hard. You know, again, look, you see these numbers, and and a lot of the competition. You know, when we would get, say, you get a thousand uh, applications. I mean, five or six hundred of them are just like throwaways. So you're really not competing against those if you have a solid application. So you throw out almost more than half because they're just not of any quality that would be close to getting. So what does program. that mean when it's not a quality? Because I mean, there's a sure, big piece missing. Here in this a big room. piece missing. Either big piece. it's a, what's that? Either, um, either it is an idea that is harebrained, or you have a team that has no possible potential to execute on what might be a good idea. Okay, now this is okay. So this is my next question. Um, so back to the Harvard um, mm -hmm. example. So in Harvard, it's it's pretty like it's pretty easy to know how to get in, right? It's GPA, it's SAT scores. Uh, those are pretty measurable metrics. You know, GPA is what I call maybe the subjective because you can get an A one high school, which is different from another high school mm -hmm. in the same class. That A might be a little different, but SAT scores is pretty like that's standardized. That's an objective uh, metric. So, uh, do you have sort of like an equivalent metric uh, for for tech stars? So, what I mean by subjective measurements, you know, A plus team, great design. And then on the objective side, you know, these measurements such as growth rates, right, user growth rates or monthly unique user engagement levels. And I know there's one metric that, uh, that David Tish always talked about was this whole DAO over Mao, which is da daily active over monthly active. Mm -hmm. So what sort, of, what sort of metrics do you, let's talk about five top metrics. For, in the on? application side or to, for yeah. a company to succeed? Or? Yeah, well, well both. Just, yeah. both. So, I mean, that's, I mean, what's your, that's there, what there's you're... Not, there's not always going to be a lot of active metrics in the application phase. It really depends where you are. I mean, let's talk about both. In sure. the application phase, we put all the names on the wall, we get a monkey from the zoo, give him a dart, and then he just throws a dart, and that's where we do. Um, all right, everybody. <laughs> That's it, tech stars. So, uh, you know, again, I think in terms of the application process, um, idea and team um, are going to, so the team, we're going to get some sense of the team. Obviously, some make it to an interview stage. I mean, to even get there, does this idea even make sense? Do these people have a realistic vision of what it takes to execute the idea? Uh, do they show that there's a need in the marketplace? Um, are they, the, do they complement one another? Uh, do they have any major holes in their team? If so, are they aware of those holes and they know they need to address them? Uh, those type of uh, things we're going to look at. Um, the idea, you know, again, is it an idea that is a real need in the marketplace? Is it uh, realistic that they can achieve it? Uh, you know, addressable size, addressable market size. Are you looking at less than or more than a billion, or you know, over 150? We haven't. I mean, no. I mean, there's been certainly uh, ideas in the past that have been smaller, addressable market sizes that uh, have been fine. I mean, I don't think there's any problem if you can demonstrate a marketplace of a few hundred million that you can own, I mean, 
that's that's pretty exciting. So, so what's a good uh, daily active, daily active over monthly active? What's a good ratio? And what I mean by that, so anybody who knows what this, yeah, you can you know, yeah. it, it, the, the, the right. it's service dependent, right? I mean, so I mean, I, I don't know how you do a general rule. It really depends what you're doing. Um, so I, um, um, I mean, let's go way back to the days of BlueMountain.com. Yeah. Um, this was a holiday dependent business. Pro Flowers too. Yeah. So I mean, this was something that this time of year, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, there'd be enormous peaks. I mean, one of the biggest challenges with Pro Flowers is. Uh, we were running at a, a, a 20x rate, uh, and we were, you know, even though we were a, you know, when I sold it, $250 million a year company, we were a $2 billion a year company for a week a year. I mean, that's really hard logistically. So again, you know, if you were trying to look at that and you're saying, well, who's coming back and buying each one? No, they're, you know, they're coming back twice a year. and that's, So it really just depends on the business. Right, right. Now, the reason why I'm asking this is because uh, I had, well, I had met Eugene Chung in New York mm -hmm. before he got let go, but that was one of the things he asked. I mean, that was that one of the metrics. And when I was trying to uh, tell him about a startup, he's like, what's Delver Mal? Delver Mal, Delver Mal. And you know, just so you guys know, Facebook has a, a daily active users over a monthly of 50%. So that's sort of like, I mean, that's up there, obviously. Um, but I mean, would you even look at one that's, that's like less than 20%? I mean, that, there's gotta be a cutoff, right? I mean, it all depends. I gave the example on one end. The businesses that I've happened to be involved, if you look at flowers or greeting cards, you're going to see a very different number because uh, the usage patterns are... And so, you know, if it's a service in people's lives that they're supposed to use every day and they're not, sure. it's going to be a problem if they're, if a, you know, a lot of users are only checking it out once or twice a month. So I, there's no answer sure. that cuts across okay. everything. No, no problem, no problem. I'll, 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 it, I'll just, let go of that question. You, I mean, so. and again, you happen to be talking to somebody where in my experience in flowers and greeting cards, it was a much lower ratio right, right. in those particular sectors. Um, so... Hashtag startup grind at Jared Polis. What's right. that? At Jared Polis. Jared Polis, got it. Tweet out. Um, so what would you say most of your startups in terms of the selection process that were founder referred? So other startup founders had say, hey, uh, Jared, look at this, versus cold applications on the website. You're talking strictly about tech stars, you mean? Yeah, tech stars. Uh, it, was, it became word of mouth fairly quickly. Um, there wasn't... Uh, while, again, our, the name Techstars wasn't nearly as famous as it was today, there was also a lot less in the way of accelerators. I think it was just us and Y Combinator at that time. I don't recall any others that were I mean, there might have been different models, but it was really just two. Uh, and so we never had a problem with applications. Um, and it spread through word of mouth that this program existed. And, and, and we would dr literally direct people to apply on the website. I mean, that was, even if you came in through somebody you knew, we'd say, will you go apply on the Do website? Do you think that that applies even today? So if somebody wants to apply to Techstars or 500 Startups or YC, go through an existing portfolio company and get the referral? Is that what you suggest? You have to apply in the front door. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to lobby, if you will. I mean, if you know people, I mean, you don't want to be annoying. Um, but I, I can't, certainly doesn't mean you get a slot. I mean, plenty of companies, you know, and proposals even from foreign countries that don't know anybody here get in on their merits. So, I mean, it's not like it's determinant. But again, it can't hurt if uh, people you know and mentors in the network are putting in good words for you. Okay, great. I mean, I mean again, as long as you're not stalking somebody or something. <laughs> At least not on Twitter. Um, so let's 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 talk about uh, your political career. Um, why did you decide to run for office? Uh, you could have retired in the Bahamas, and and actually on Wikipedia, uh, it says that you are the sixth wealthiest person in Congress. Uh, why did you decide to go in, into politics? I mean, you could have, like I said, you could have retired. Uh, well, this is a, a brand new set of challenges. I, um, you know, did well enough in business that I was able to think about what I wanted to do next, and uh, I want to make an impact on our planet and, and our way of life and our, uh, the country that allowed me to succeed, the United States of America, and I wanted to give back uh, for a portion of my life, and so I uh, decided to dedicate, dedicate a portion of my life towards public service. I first got involved part-time. I was on the school board for six years well, I'm gonna talk about while that. I was yeah, in yeah. business, yeah, so I was able to do both. Uh, and then, then full time. This is the, the this is my fifth year now in Congress. Okay. 
So I, this, th I really want to talk about this first experience in politics mm -hmm. when you were running uh, for the Colorado State Board mm -hmm. of Education. Okay, this is really a, truly a underdog story. Um, talk about when you were trying to seat, unseat the incumbent, mm -hmm. uh, pretty largely popular. You had 1.6 million people, and this is, a, this is a position that you had to get voted into. Right. 1.6 million people voted, but you won by a hairline fracture with the number of people that's less than this room. I did. There was less th people in this room that decided you know, to be on that board of, of Won by 92 votes, yeah. 90 vo 92 yeah. votes. So can you talk, I mean, I love this story because I mean, it almost didn't happen, your political career. I mean, would that be, <laughs> would that be a fair assessment? I mean, if, if you had lost that, would you? I don't know. I, I, look, I mean, and I didn't, you know, it was, it was a recount. You know, obviously it's that close and, and actually. I um, chafes. Uh, yeah, I mean, on election night, or not, within a couple of days of the election, we thought I'd, I'd won actually by about 2,200 votes. But then there was a recount. It was so close. And 30 days later, the final vote tally came out, and I won by 92 votes, uh, which meant that everybody I talked to made a difference. I mean, you know, all those doors I knocked on, all the, all the people. We had a bus that I went around the state in a school bus. And uh, boy, you know, all of that made an enormous difference, or I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to serve. Uh, and I don't I don't know what route I would have taken. Who knows? But that must have given you more fuel, right, to to aspire higher. Now, you know, running for Congress, right? Because uh, it, it, I learned that I should try to have secure a bit larger margins margins of victory, so I don't have to wait a month to see if I win. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that story. Um, so let's talk about some of the legislation. My margin of victory has been more secure in every subsequent election. Okay, so. that's great. That's good to know. Good. Um, so can we talk about some of the legislations you're working on that mm -hmm. um, that would resonate with the startup community? What's what sort of sure. legislation? That well, we one should of the big things that um, that I'm obviously passionate about for a number of reasons and would be a huge boost to startup community is immigration reform. So. Uh, within immigration reform, there's a, a, a number of dimensions for entrepreneurship and startups, um, but, but two of them in particular. One is uh, a startup visa that would allow founders, a uh, particular class of visa for founders that would be able to come here if they receive some backing and start their company here in our country instead of being forced to start their company abroad, which happens every day. Uh, the other one does to do with capital formation, investor visas, EB-5, trying to streamline that program and increase the cap to allow more uh, investment uh, in, in companies uh, here in the United States. Certainly the high skills piece is also important, making sure even if they're not founders or investors, you can get the high skilled workforce that you need uh, here in this country to make your company succeed and so you don't have to relocate overseas. Um, and my passion in public service has always been education. So, um, you know, for us, to, for people to even be empowered to be entrepreneurs and start their own companies, you, they need to be able to have an education and be able to have the skills they need to start their companies. So that's all the way you know, the K through 12 system, as well as affordable access to college, um, the whole continuum. So that's been a big piece of my work here as well. Okay. Um, I want to really kind of hone in on this co comprehensive immigration reform. Um, I know you sort of touched on it, but can you explain to us what it is and why do our, the startup need to pay attention to that? I mean, is it sort of where we could retain talent here? And uh, I guess, I, you know, let's, is it something that will affect startups directly? Yeah, it has a huge impact on every American, <clears throat> and uh, there was a bill, a bipartisan bill, that passed the Senate with uh, 68 votes, I believe. That's very rare to get such a lot, a strong bipartisan majority. <clears throat> we have a version in the House that we're working on, but we haven't been able to convince the Speaker to bring it to a vote. Basically, it would secure our borders. Um, it would uh, do the changes we talked about on the high skill side, allow startup visas to exist, uh, improve uh, the workplace verification to make sure the people who uh, don't have the right to work here legally aren't able to work here legally. Uh, and it would really address uh, job creation in our country, it would reduce our deficit uh, by hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's a great package um, that is overwhelmingly popular with the American people. 75% or so of the American people support this. But we haven't been able to yet find the political way to actually guide it through the Republican controlled so, House. So uh, someone had told me that uh, what, what, so you said it's passed in the Senate and that yeah. happened in, in last July. Mm -hmm. And then the House doesn't want to pass because there's this little provisions with the Dreamers. So Dreamers, is that correct? Uh, it, there is provisions with the Dreamers. These yeah. are young people who grew up in our country that right. um, you know, know no other country. Uh, it provides them a way to you know, permanent status and become citizens. Um, so that's what the Senate bill does. So what can we do as a startup community to help 
folks like you. I mean, uh, obviously you represent us, sure. but what can we, we, we do to help pass this bill? Well, if you live in Washington, D.C., you have taxation without representation. <laughs> but if you live in another part of the country, you have a representative. Right. Um, and it's important for you to, you know, if your representative already sponsors immigration reform, the bill is called H.R. 15 in the House. You can call and thank them. If they don't, tell them to co-sponsor H.R. 15, which is the immigration reform bill in the House, which uh, we... Uh, are close to having enough support to pass. I think we might already have it, but we just have to convince the speaker to bring it forward. Okay, great. So that looks like it's getting close. Great. Well, we can pass it. We yeah. still have to convince the we don't the, we the members don't control the floor. We would have to convince the speaker and the majority leader Eric Cantor to bring the bill to the floor. I do think we could pass it if we can get them to bring it to the floor. Okay, great. I'd like to talk about uh, internet privacy versus piracy. Um, it, can we ever have a perfect mix of protecting intellectual property uh, while protecting privacy on the internet? No? Can, can we ever <clears throat> get that perfect world right? Well, you know, defining, um, defining piracy is challenging. So, um, w you know, how large does kind of the fair use, um, you know, exception go? Um, you know, is there a criminal aspect or purely a civil aspect to, you know, 15-year-olds downloading music they shouldn't be downloading? Uh, often, the uh, incumbents are the rights owners, and so they usually uh, try to stack the deck against dissemination and fair use. So too often, the laws are skewed that way. But obviously, we all have an interest as well uh, in ensuring uh, that those who innovate, you know, can reap commercial gains from their innovation. Okay, great. I mean, I guess uh, the <laughs> segue question I was trying to ask is, you know, we're startups here. Uh, is there, we're all building websites and apps. Um, is, there, is there a way, uh, uh, sort of a um, best practice where we can build out our products um, that can keep, in, keep privacy in mind? So, I mean, do we need to build out a better, like, term of service? Privacy policy, user well, don't, agreements. Don't, don't right? rip off the Mario Brothers uh, pipes. Sure, okay. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot can be done in terms of service, absolutely. Um, I, I think, pri you know, you're talking about privacy and piracy, two different issues. Right, so I'm exactly. not sure which one we're talking about. Yep. But um, on the privacy side, um, you know, right now the, uh, the government is far from the best example of, of doing what's right. So we have our own, when we hear privacy in the government context, it's NSA, it's... Uh, all of that. <clears throat> On the individual side, I think uh, as long as your customers know what you're doing with the information um, uh, and you get permission from them, you should be fine. I think if you're doing something other than what they expect, even if they formally agreed to it, uh, you, can, you, can be, you can set yourself up for a bad, bad confrontational situation with your customers. And Facebook has been up against this a number of times and you know, gone too far, come back a little, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I was really asking about the privacy part of that because I, I remember reading this article and you know, there's things, normal things that we do here, it, you know, taking pictures, right? Taking pictures uh, uh, on our phone and that geo, geo tags that. So I take pictures of my children all the time and, and they said, hey, put your pictures through the service. And they pinpoint where my house is and it scares the living crap out of me. Mm -hmm. And I wish that, that you know, this, this service provider told me, hey, by the way, you know, we, we keep track of, of, you know, we geo tag your pictures. Well, you know, and technically, I'm sure you agreed to that in their user agreement. And that's which, what I'm saying. I don't which think you I read did. meticulously. Yes, I, I, I read it meticulously. We all read meticulously right. every right. word. Uh, and of course, they're in a position to negotiate some of those words with the vendor and saying, "Can you change this or that?" I always wonder what would happen if you went back and tried to redline, you know, their user agreement. Uh, I probably wind up in some junk mail folder somewhere and never be read exactly. by anybody. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, th I thought I would t really talk about that. Um, let's talk about the. Um, Aaron's Law. I know that uh, the, it's a pretty high-profile case. Aaron Schwartz uh, committed suicide because the government came after him for something really, really stupid, right? Uh, they, they said, we're going to give you 30 years imprisonment and $1 million uh, in penalty just for downloading. I mean, it might have been $100 million worth of, um, what was it, uh, downloadable, downloading academic journals. Yeah, and the company didn't even want to press charges. So, right. I mean, yeah. And so, what is your opinion about that? I mean, this, this is obviously ridiculous, and he, he was a scapegoat of this. Right. Um, I, I, what I worry about in that particular case is it seems like they scapegoated him for his political speech. Uh, he was a critic of uh, 
copyright law and he had his own political beliefs. And uh, it seemed like that uh, got the ire of prosecutors and in our country that anybody should be prosecuted or singled out because of their political beliefs is extremely scary. Um, but, you know, again, uh, these are civil issues. They shouldn't uh, be criminal issues in this particular case. And so that's why we, inter we introduced, along with Zolofkin and others, the law that would uh, uh, change that. Okay. Um, going to the next topic here. I really wanted to, because we're, I, I really want to get, get through these questions um, before we open up the Q&A. Um, I want to talk about David Cohen. David Cohen, we had invited him as a guest to Startup Grind last week. Okay. Uh, and so I, I actually had the opportunity to talk to him in the green room. Great. And uh, I told him that I was going to be interviewing mm -hmm. you. So when I asked him, what kind of questions should I ask Jared? Uh-oh. <laughs> and he uh -oh. says, oh, 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 ask him this. Uh-oh. So How did it go with him? Was it a fun startup, oh, right? Yeah, it was fun. It was awesome. Yeah. It. Good. So ready it's for the question? Out. Sure. Okay, great. So he said, why don't you ask him about the time when you met a startup on MTV's Real World. I don't know, like that's what he told me to ask you, so. Uh, well, that could mean one of two things. Okay, sure. <laughs> <I'm not gonna> <laughs> <laughs> um, it, could mean, um, it could mean that we, we did have a reality show ourselves at Techstars, um, uh, which was fun um, a few years ago. Uh, and then the other one it could mean is I did interact with the Real World uh, DC uh, team. I was actually on, I was on Real World for, for about, yeah, when they did Real World DC, this was probably four years ago. Uh, I think I was on for, you know, all 14 seconds. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was, uh, that was, you know, so anyway, I met and interacted with them. I, I'm it? not sure That's which one, I don't know which one you referred to. It sounded like I, it was going to be something I, crazy. I wish I had a better story. It's, it's probably the actual Real World one that I was in for DC, but um, it was not, not directly related to startups. Okay, great. Um, and then we have a real world um, uh, veteran in Congress. We actually have a member of Congress who was actually on the real world a number of years ago. Right. Um, now we're talking about DC. So this is great. Let's talk about the DC ecosystem. Um, you've seen Boulder startup scene, the startup community thrive. Uh, do you see maybe some similarities here in DC and Boulder? Well, D.C. is a big city. We're just a small country town. Um, you know, we have about 100,000 people, as I said. Uh, I mean, D.C., went, you know, it's, it's transformed enormously. I mean, even when I first got here five years ago, um, there was very little startup infrastructure. Now I see a city that is in the forefront, um, in the top group of cities uh, with startup infrastructure. Um, you know when there's so many accelerators or incubators that you can't even list them all off the tip of your tongue, that you're in a city with a lot going on. Co-working space, accelerators, incubators. So it's exciting for DC's economic development. Um, it's fun to be here uh, in a city that has it. It allows us to showcase uh, our nation's capital to other legislators who might not have as much going on back home. Uh, and I think uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of that exciting action going on in here in DC. Okay, so my next set of questions is sort of like leading it up. And this is the reason why I brought you out here. Oh, really? That's the next you can question. Finally find out. Okay. Okay, so David Tisch, quote yep. unquote, this is what he said. But, you know, obviously before he moved on, but when he was managing director sure. of New York, he said, quote unquote, Techstars deliberately selects locations away from Silicon Valley because these areas um, had been relatively over overlooked by other entrepreneurs. And so you've expanded to five mm -hmm. additional cities. Okay, so here's 2009, Boston. 2010, Seattle, 2011, New York, 2012, and I don't get this one, but San Antonio, which I guess is the rack space, mm -hmm. 2013, Austin, 2014, do you have any, any, uh, any insights where 2014 might be? Because I have oh, some suggestions. You're looking for a specific announcement. Yes, here. yes, yeah. I don't know. Do you have, do mm -hmm. you have any, I can uh, make a suggestion. Bethesda? <laughs> Well, um, you know, so I, 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 you know, it's not likely to be Silicon Valley. So I mean, again, sure. that's a, and Davis did an amazing job in New York. Um, there is a lot. Uh, there's already a vibrant startup ecosystem uh, in Silicon Valley, and so the kind of the advantage or the delta that you you could bring with the with the tech stars is marginal at best in a community like that. There are plenty of other communities that can benefit. Um, 
the program uh, has now pulled in David Brown full time to run it. Um, they plan on continuing uh, to expand. Uh, David Cohen is working on some related venture capital projects um, and, and really uh, opening up uh, capital formation even more for not only uh, Techstar alumni companies, but other companies as well. Is that like a political non-answer? No, that, you did, totally didn't answer my question. So what can we do to collectively change your mind? Uh, so let me just... Well, did you, I hope you asked David Cohen this when he was here, if he was here a couple weeks ago, right? No, no, he was, he was at the Startup Grind Global. Oh, okay. Were you able to ask him this? or? No, I didn't because, I mean, oh, I figured on. you'd He's... be the lower hanger fruit. Or yeah. Something. <laughs> so so, so here, here's, 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 here's I, yeah. my... Okay, so here's, okay. My, here's my spiel here, okay? Um, <clears throat> this area has the highest per capita um, of postgraduate degrees. It has, next to Silicon Valley, obviously, it has 20, you know, 25% of the government's $1 trillion budget has to go to small business set-asides, and most of the good ones are here. Uh, we have the deepest pool of engineering talent, including DARPA, NIST, NSF, DIA, CIA, NASA, HHS, NIH, and NSA. So, and I, and I have personally seen some really, really amazing, uh, you know, projects through the S SBIR, which is sort of like the, mm -hmm. you know, government small business um, uh, initiative. So, the greatest technology known to mankind has either been in, had its the, their inception here. So, GPS, laser, driverless cars, drones, internets. Why can't we have a tech stars accelerator here in DC? Well, I was thinking Fargo would be the next one. Okay, got it. I mean... <laughs> okay, got it. But why, why can't we have, like, sort of, you know, what you did in San Antonio, you know, which was uh, the cloud? I mean, I mean, it wouldn't seem that far Look, off to I have mean, an enterprise. Uh, and that, that one was a strategic partnership, sure. um, and, and there's been a couple others that have been aligned with others as well. I would certainly bring it up with David Brown, really, at this point. Sure. So, I mean... David Cohen. You're a and I congressman, are, you know. I'm just a congressman, congressman, and you're just a congressman. David Cohen's just a VC, <laughs> so uh, you want to go into David Brown. But I um, sure. mean, make the case. Um, they have limited capacity to expand. Um, they plan on expanding, and uh, I think you want to make the case about why your city should come ahead of a city like Fargo. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, they do have a movie behind them, so um, I mean, you know, my thinking is, you know, enterprise. Uh, I'm sorry, the in entrepreneurs. You know, they'll, they'll, there's two things. They'll be incentivized to come here, and then they will think twice to leave. Because so many times I've already seen startups here, really good ones, leaving. And so, you know, bringing a, a big brand like Techstars, I think this is maybe sort of what our, our city needs. I, uh, well, you know, again, we'll make that case to David Brown, and sure. if, if he asks my opinion, I'll certainly opine. Um, I think this city is here to stay on the startup scene with or without tech stars. Sure. So, you know, it hasn't quite come into your own confidence yet. You're going to be, this is, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of capital here. I know angel networks are still forming, but there's a lot of money here, and, and that's a prerequisite for angel networks. Uh, there's a lot of business here, uh, high skilled workforce. Uh, with or without tech stars, um, the startup scene in DC is here to stay. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, so I have two last questions, but I'll open it up to Q&A. But before I do, because someone's going to probably ask this question anyways. They always do. Um, what is your biggest failure, and how did you recover from it? Well, I, you know, I've had a, a number of failures and uh, a few successes. So I've really had um, three major successes, uh, American Information Systems, BlueMountain.com, ProFlowers.com. Uh, my two biggest, uh, and, and, and several others that were, you know, washes or two X's or three X's or whatever. Uh, in terms of failures, um, the two would be um, one that I did uh, called Lucidity, which was kind of like an e-commerce attachment. This was in the early 2000s, Internet 1.0, and when the kind of meltdown happened in 99, 2000, we were able to get an extra round of financing and went away. Uh, and then the other one um, was, uh, was more uh, recent, Fuser. Uh, it was probably seven, eight years ago it started or so. That was kind of Internet 2.0. Um, but that was kind of um, also kind of the timing wasn't quite right with it. I, I, what did I take away? I mean, you certainly need to know when to pull the plug. I mean, we did obviously pull the plug on those two. Obviously, when you do pull the plug, you always wish you pulled the plug six months or a year earlier. But, I mean, you didn't know at that time. You thought you might still get, you know, some more financing. Um, you, know, it you know, it takes uh, trying to succeed. And you can't be afraid of failure. 
uh, we all know that most startups don't succeed. Um, you know that going in. Uh, if, if you were told otherwise, you're you're grossly misinformed. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it, you always hope that you get the one that works. And, and sometimes it takes. It never give up. It takes a couple failures. Don't be afraid to pivot. Um, certainly takes a couple failures to have a success. And I mean, I was relatively fortunate that out of um, you know, depending on what role I played, I was probably you know. In, heavily involved with 12 to 15 startups that I had three that were very highly successful. Awesome. We're going to open this up to Q&A. First of all, do we have any VIP members here? So, uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. They're not raising their hand. Any VIP? Okay, great. So first question. Here we go. So uh, I like the question. I like the question, um, why is Techstars not here? But uh, you kind of dodged it, so I'm going to ask it in a different way. What does uh, DC need for Techstars to come here? Well, why don't you? Ask, I mean, the better question is, what does DC need for the to take the startup scene to the next level? Um, I mean, it doesn't miss it. It's not missing anything that TechStars would want. I mean, TechStars could be here for sure, just like they're in other cities. So again, we didn't make the case to uh, you know to David Brown about picking here as opposed to other cities. Um, what does it need? I think it needs, um, and I, I know the efforts are underway, but certainly a, a more developed angel funding network. I think other cities have that. There's a lot of money here, but there's not as much of a culture of investing in startups. I think that's starting, uh, and it exists, but uh, that can grow. Um, it's a better problem than have to be in a community that doesn't have the money and doesn't even have the potential investors. There's certainly a lot of people here that would be good investors, but they have to be linked to the startup community. Um, you know, I, I, it, it, it has most of what you'd want for a startup community to succeed. I already see great success starting. It needs, it needs successful stories. It needs some startups here that have gone on to high, great degrees of success. Um, some that continue to operate independently post-IPO, some that have sold, and then it, that will cre reinforce itself and create an ecosystem around the next generation of startups. But it's no surprise that there's not a large number of those to date uh, because the startup scene is relatively new here. Okay, next question. Hi, I guess this is a little bit of a hardball question. Um, I was wondering, uh, I've been on the fence a little uh, about the whole Affordable Care Act, and uh, in, I actually, in some ways, I'm, I'm in favor of it, and I was actually a little disappointed that the small business exchanges didn't roll out, and I was wondering if you could talk about how that, the act affects uh, startups and small, small businesses. Well, I mean, my state has a small business exchange, Colorado. I, I, I think many states do. Um, I haven't looked at which ones have it and which ones don't. Um, I think it is uh, of great help uh, to startup companies in general because startup companies worry about health care. And so if you can buy through an individual exchange and you don't have to get it through your company, the more options there are in the individual marketplace, uh, the better for entrepreneurs and startup companies, particularly uh, if, if you have a pre-existing condition and you couldn't really get insurance on your own pre-Affordable Care Act, it's a, uh, a big deal. Probably from the startup perspective, it would be nice if there were some cheaper options available, if there were some higher deductible catastrophic options that uh, there are less of now than there used to be, there's still some. Uh, those would tend to be the kinds of options that would be attractive to cash-strapped entrepreneurs. Uh, and maybe there's some changes that can be made that can increase the availability of those kinds of programs. But compared to what we had before, uh, I think it definitely increases individual options for entrepreneurs who don't get insurance through a large company that employs them. Okay, next question. All right, so political campaigns uh, every year uh, in the past have been millions, donations, millions, uh, in the future, billions with uh, the 2012 election. So I just want to know, what do you see as the next frontier uh, for startups in political campaigns and committees and whoever else is giving money? Um, you know, I, I don't really recommend that space to people. It's a very strange space. It's obviously a very cyclical space. Uh, all the money comes in a relatively short period of time, uh, and whatever worked one cycle is usually not going to work the next cycle. There's certainly companies that have built a solid business over time, like NGP, a database business that provides a lot of donor reporting software, um, stable businesses over time. But it's not a particularly good place to make money. Uh, that being said, um, 
I would look at things that are working in the commercial space, if you are intent on entering the political space, and uh, seeing what those ramifications are in the political space, because we are essentially advertising uh, in the same sense that a product is. You're selling a product, the product happens to be a candidate, and it's usually a little bit behind consumer marketing for products. So if, you can, if we can find what works uh, and has worked in, in the product space uh, and apply it to the political space, there's always going to be those kinds of opportunities. Okay, next question. This is pretty interesting. Okay, as one of the few tech-savvy members of Congress, um, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin and then also on raising capital through crowdfunding through the JOBS Act? Uh, Bitcoin is uh, great. You know, I, I, when I was playing around with it a year ago, I wish I had bought more than one or two of them, $12 a piece. Um, uh, and I wish I hadn't, you know, subsequently lost the one or two that I did buy. Um, I think that, you know, the biggest thing, you know, I know it went down by 50%, I think, here in the last couple of days. But I think that, you know, I try to keep the kind of the government out of it and kind of see what evolves uh, unless there's, you know, criminal schemes or scams that involve it, which inevitably there are. Um, but uh, in general, uh, it'll be interesting to see what type of online currencies evolve. Uh, I think there's certainly a role for that and may or may not be Bitcoin. I mean, probably won't. But... Uh, I think there'll be some type of Bitcoin successor in the five to ten year time frame that will have some advantages over the currencies that nation states offer uh, that are really only backed by their full faith and credit and don't have any solid real world backing anyway. So it's exciting. Um, it's fun to watch the Bitcoin economy grow, albeit largely in a speculative bubble and not based on real transactions. Um, but I hope that we see more utility and functionality from online currencies rather than just speculative value. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, crowdfunding. 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 Uh, we did our part in Congress, uh, but it has uh, been stymied by the SEC to date. Uh, the concept was it should be extremely easy and that people should be able to, just as they do in Kickstarter, but actually get a little equity, invest in startups, $50.00. $1,000 up to $10,000. We just had a limit. Say, okay, you can't you know, lose your whole life savings on it. Limited $10,000. Should have been very easy. But instead, like everything in government, they did 900 pages of draft rules, and it still isn't available. And I don't know if it ever will be in as nearly as easy format as we wanted it to be or contemplated it in the law. So uh, I've done a series of letters trying to get it unlocked and done. I, eventually, there will be something that is perhaps a poor imitation of what crowdfunding should be that gets rolled out. Uh, but it has been very disappointing to watch even a widely popular law that was supported by Democrats and Republicans get sort of locked up in the bureaucracy where it, where it is still imprisoned. Okay, one, uh, we'll have two more questions. One question here. What's your stance on net neutrality and how it affects small businesses? I'm uh, for uh, net neutrality. I mean, exactly how you establish it. Uh, you know, there's a number of ways that you can do it, and we all saw this recent uh, case. Uh, in, in essence, um, the innovative side of the internet is going to be uh, the bits and bytes that travel across uh, uh, the backbone. Um, obviously, backbone owners need to justify their investment. There's no doubt about that. But that's not the innovative part that drives the internet economy, drives the job creation. Uh, and we need to make sure there's a level playing field, in particular for startups, who would be among the least likely to afford uh, special fees that they have to incur just to, to get the same treatment uh, as larger content providers and service providers. Okay, one last question. Hi, thanks so much for being here. So for those of us who have startups or small businesses that we're trying to take to you know, a much higher level, short of being in an incubator, I mean an accelerator, what are some of the steps and resources that you would recommend um, that we use based on your experience, but without the resources that you currently have? Well, I, I think it's some of the same, these formulas work that uh, incubators like Techstars and other accelerators like Techstars and others and incubators have used. I mean, meaning, yes, even without being part of it, you can find the right mentors and surround yourself with them. Try to get help from people who've been there and done that. Uh, challenge yourself with time frames to develop your business plan and your elevator pitch and pitching investors and institute and hold yourself accountable for those time frames. So you can recreate uh, yourself 
uh, and it's not secret. I mean, none of these programs are highly proprietary. I think they're even happy to tell people what they do. You can recreate a lot of that value add yourself outside of the program as well. And um, you know, I would just look at what some of them do. If some of it's not for you, you don't adapt it. Uh, if it is, uh, you should integrate it into kind of what you're doing. So, thank you. So you, have a, you had a very long day today, so we're going to wrap it up. We have one question, probably the most important question we always ask all of our speakers. So who is your favorite superhero or historic figure and why? Uh, oh, that's right. You told me you'd ask that. You better I give forgot me the to, right answer because it's going to be... I forgot to think of a compelling... We're definitely going to go with the superhero. Uh, oh. We're definitely going to go with the superhero. Well, I mean... Let me think okay, here. you can do superhero and then do the historic figure. Um, okay. Because otherwise, this, what I have is going gonna, gonna to blow up in my face. What if, what if they're one and the same? Oh, that's no, true. Okay. We got uh, in terms of uh, superhero, we're going to go... We're going to take a journey to X-Men... And we're going to go with, um, let's see here. There's so many of them that are so cool. I'm going to go with Storm. Storm, okay. Yes. What about historic figure? Uh, historic figure. Let's see. Should I? <laughs> okay, you need an actual historic figure. You got, okay, you need an actual historic figure. Let's well, I mean, uh, we, I had asked you this question. But you said it could be a superhero. Well, yeah, I, but so okay. maybe your staffer gave, gave you the right Historical figures question. are so disappointing compared to Storm. Yeah, I know, but... Uh, <laughs> None of them can su summon major weather. Should I, should I, should okay, I clue we'll you go in? With, uh, we'll go with uh, somebody living or... No, dead. They have to be dead, okay. Preferably in baseball. Baseball player? Yeah. Oh, well, we're going to go with Jackie Robinson. All right, yes, okay. So here we have, we have a... Uh, All right. We have Jackie Robinson with Star Grind cool. swag on there. Stealing and home plate. Right, stealing home plate and going for the star grind right there. So Awesome, there right. we go. Congressman Jared Pauls, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. That's great. How did you know I was going to pick Jackie Robinson? I asked your staffer. Oh, okay.